Well, it's the final Sunday of 2021, and if you're new here, we have a, a habit we've done for six or seven years that on this last Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, we mix things up a little bit and we, we tag team preach, and it's been, it's been fun for us uh, the past few years to do this, and hopefully a little bit of a fresh way to hear God's Word this morning. Uh, we want to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. You can find that on page 807 of the Pew Bible, the Blue Pew Bible. Matthew chapter 1 is a place where many good intentions die. And the reason for that is many New Testament Bible reading plans start in Matthew chapter 1. Not the one that Grant chose. We're starting in Luke. He's on to this. But many plans start in Matthew chapter 1. It's New Year's Day. You're all amped up to read the Bible with great intentions. You open up Matthew 1, and you find a long list of names. And Abraham, Father Isaac, and Isaac, Father Jacob. And by the end, you're struggling to stay awake, and you're not super motivated to keep reading your Bible reading plan. Beginning in Matthew chapter 1 is like going to a fancy meal and starting with a salad. It's not bad. It's just not... Not, not great. It's not necessarily the best part of the meal. Some people love salads, Andy. <laughs> yeah, this is true. This is true. Not me. Um, the, the reality is, as dry as Matthew chapter 1, I'm a little bit nervous if this is going to be happening on the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> we have gone over this quickly, but uh, we'll see. Um, but Matthew chapter 1 seems a bit dry, and yet we want to we show today Matthew is shouting and proclaiming through this list of names some great truth about God, about his glory, about his plan, and his purpose. Uh, Most of all, the fact that Jesus' family tree is very, very dysfunctional, and yet God's working out a plan to bring forth the Savior through this dysfunctional lineage. In other words, the people that Jesus came from are the type of people that Jesus came for. And so this morning, we want to do 14 brief sermons in one. And if that sounds like a lot, last year's sermon on this week had 60 points. So we've pared it down a little bit this year. We made it last year, sort of. Um, So we're going to kick it off 14 sermons in one. That was your cue. All right. Thank you. The first sermon from Matthew chapter 1 is called Liar, Liar, Tunic on fire. See what he did there? Tunic? Because they didn't have pants back then. They just wore the tunics and the... Yeah. All right, moving on. It's clever. Yeah, clever. (laughs) So we read in Matthew chapter 1 that Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob. Now, if you remember from our Genesis series that in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham to leave his father's house and to go to a land that he was yet to show him. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to have many, many descendants. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so Abraham left his father's household. Six verses later, though, we see that he is afraid that the Egyptians are going to kill him when he comes there. He's afraid they're going to kill him because his wife is so beautiful. And so I understand Abraham's pain there. But... He comes up with this plan that says, hey, pretend you're my sister when they ask if you're my wife. So the Egyptian king, he asks him, is that your wife? He goes, no, you, that's my sister. And said, the, sorry about that. The truth came out, though, and kings don't like it when they're lied to. And so it says there in the text that the Lord protected them. Now, this happened again in Genesis chapter 20, a different king. And Abraham lied. And then the apple didn't fall far from the tree because Isaac did the exact same thing that Abraham did in the exact same kind of situation. He lied to a king about his wife. And then that lying gene that got passed on, it's not really a gene, but I called it a gene, but that lying gene got passed on down to Jacob, who manipulates and deceives his brother in Genesis chapter 5 and then lies to his father in Genesis chapter 7. 27. So you see that the whole family line is one of liars. Yet, in Hebrews chapter 11, which is known as the Hall of Fame for Faith, it's a chapter where the author is bringing up examples of saints 
throughout the Old Testament who have lived by faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all make that chapter because it says they desired to live in God's promised land. They went out and lived by faith. And verse 16 of Hebrews 11, it says, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. See, the Lord knew Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's faults. He knew they were liars, yet he remained steadfast in carrying out his purpose through them because they walked by faith. And the same is true for us today, that God is not ashamed to be called our God. Even though we will stumble in our walk of faith, the Lord calls us to keep walking. And when we do that, he will not be ashamed to be our God. Continue our series through Matthew's genealogy. Sermon number two is called Don't Fake Murder Your Brother. The deception found within God's family line doesn't end with the patriarchs. And so you'll notice in verse two, it says Judah and his brothers. That's another way of saying the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 children of Jacob who became the Israelites. Judah and his brothers are the foundation of God's people. And get this, the foundation of God's people rests on the character traits of these 12 men. Judah and his brothers are known for selling their brother Joseph into slavery to the Egyptians for 20 shekels of silver. Joseph was the favorite child for sure. Parading around in a magnificently colored kingly robe made his brothers furious with him. Essentially, their dad, Jacob, was showing off his eighth-born child from his second wife, whom he loved more than his first wife, who was the older and less attractive sister of his second wife that his uncle Laban tricked him into marrying after seven years of hard work for the second but first desired wife, but got the other instead, who was still, turns out, to be his first cousin. We've all been there, am I right? So... (laughs) So many years had passed, and and Joseph becomes the vice pres of Egypt, and his brothers came to Egypt during this famine, and so they're reunited with their brother Joseph, but they're terrified because the man that they almost killed many years ago happened to be the very man in their presence that would decide their fate. And so they begin to apologize to Joseph for what they've done, and Joseph's response to his brothers is profound. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph tells his brothers this, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so as we read these words, we can't help but think of another man who was betrayed for some shekels of silver, mistreated by evil men, and apparently killed, but then later rose to power to bring about the salvation of many people. Jesus. God used the actions of sinful men to bring about the salvation of many people. So through Jesus' death and resurrection, there is salvation. And sometimes we don't have a reason for the details of everyday life. But what we do have is the big picture of God's plan found in God's word. That no matter what God brings us to, he's going to bring us through. Our job is to trust him. And ultimately, in the end, everything will work itself out for good for all those who are united to this promised king of Judah and his brothers. Sermon number three is called An abandoned widow becomes an undercover prostitute, which results in accidental incest, massive hypocrisy, and dramatic public scandal. Matthew chapter 1, verse 3 says, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. The story of Judah and Tamar is in Genesis chapter 38, and because it's a non-children's church week, we're not going to go through all the details of that story, and even if children's church was going on, it's such a scandalous story that I don't know that I'd be comfortable sharing it up here from the pulpit. Now you're all going to want to go read that, probably the rest of the sermon, Genesis chapter 38. But Judah is a pretty raunchy guy. He has a thing for women who were workers of the night. And not only that, but he completely neglects his widowed daughter-in-law, Tamar. He basically says, 
too bad, so sad, go have a good life, and he doesn't take care of her. So Tamar hatches a plan that you need to go read, but it ends up with her being pregnant with twins, and then Judah accuses her of immorality and wants to sentence her to the death penalty, and then she says, surprise, you're the dad. I don't know if the Jerry Springer show is still a thing or not, but this story was made for that. And yet, these people are in the lineage of the sinless Savior, Jesus. This is, this is massive family dysfunction. There was an accidentally incestuous prostitutional relationship which produced a link in the family line of Jesus. So I don't even, I don't even know how to explain evil and suffering and and all these crazy circumstances in our lives. But make no mistake, God is sovereign over all things. This is good news. Because even in a small town, there there are stories and generations of massive family dysfunction, of mistakes and regrets and broken relationships and branches broken off of the family tree, and other branches duct taped onto the family tree, and things that just feel like they cannot be solved. And yet Judah and Tamar's story tells us that God is working through even the messiest of family dysfunction to bring forth his good purposes in Jesus. I feel like the term dysfunction doesn't rightly describe that situation. That's very true. Understatement there, but... Leading to sermon number four, I've titled this sermon, Unlikely Hall of Famer, and it's the story of Rahab. Rahab is one of four Gentile women, Gentile means non-Jew, who is grafted into the genealogy of Jesus. And scripture does not hide the fact of what Rahab's profession was, which was prostitution. In Joshua chapter two, where we meet Rahab and the Uh, Israelites are going in to spy out Jericho. They go to Rahab's house of all places. And then in Joshua chapter 6, when Israel is attacking the city of Jericho, they even still refer to Rahab as the prostitution's house. And then this prostitute, though, is in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. And even there refers to her as the prostitute. I've often wondered when we meet Rahab, like, does she hold the grudge a little bit of always being referred to in Scripture as the prostitute? Not a very good name there, but it says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she was given a friendly welcome to the spies. See, Rahab was someone who worshipped false gods and lived a promiscuous lifestyle, yet she heard about the God who split the sea and saved his people from slavery. And so she saw the coming judgment that was about to happen upon the city of Jericho, turned from her people and the gods that she worshiped, and says, I want to be with the people of Yahweh, with the Lord Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. And what we call this when this happens in the scriptures is repentance. It's when we turn from our sinful ways and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And The reason why scripture refers to her as the prostitute is because our past does not determine our future. Let me say that again so we hear that. Our past does not determine our future. See, it doesn't matter if you're a prostitute, dancer, drug dealer, drunkard, thief, abuser, addict, convict, adulterer, partier, or someone who is just having fun. Our past does not determine our future, but there must, and this is vital, there must be repentance. There has to be a turning from sin and a joining yourself to the Lord. And the Lord, when we do that, he's in the business of taking prostitutes and making them into saints. Rahab is one of those who has a dysfunctional past, but turned to the Lord and played a part in the coming of the functional Messiah. Sermon number five, Field of Dreams. In verse five, Matthew mentions Ruth. We know Ruth from the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. And the book of Ruth begins with the phrase, in the days when the judges ruled. The time of the judges was a really rough time for Israel. 
the, the phrase that described the people of the day was everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so during this time, there was a famine in the land that caused a man by the name of Elimelech to travel outside of Israel to a foreign land called Moab. And, and with him, he took his wife, Naomi, and their two sons. And sadly, Elimelech passes away, and after Naomi's two sons marry Moabite women, the two sons then also pass away. And so Naomi is left without a husband and without her children. She's alone with her daughters-in-law. And oftentimes when we read over these stories, especially in the Old Testament, uh, we don't bother to enter into their burdens. We simply read them as a matter of fact. And and Naomi, she must have felt this extreme sadness. And at one point, she says that the Lord has dealt bitterly with her. She has a bad taste in her mouth after the tragic loss of her family. And I imagine that she had many nights where she cried herself to sleep as she felt the, the, the loneliness and the abandonment maybe even and the emptiness that has gone on in her life. So Naomi eventually returns to Bethlehem, but tells her daughters-in-law to stay in Moab with their people and to return to their gods. And so one of them chooses to stay, or chooses to return to Moab, but Ruth chooses to stay with Naomi. She sees Naomi's sorrow, and she stays near to her. Ruth also devotes her life to Naomi, and she says this, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people shall be my people, and your God will be my God. And so as Ruth and Naomi return to Bethlehem, Ruth sees the man of her dreams in a field. Field of dreams. Sees the man of her dreams in a field, and it turns out that this man was the family redeemer, the kinsman redeemer. And now I'm not sure if many of us still practice the kinsman redeemership today, But essentially, the Israelite practice was, if a woman lost her husband, the closest relative of the deceased would marry the woman and care for her and her children, and if necessary, provide an heir to the family for the family inheritance. They would redeem the family line. This was Boaz. Boaz was a noble character. He loved God, and he sees Ruth's devotion to Naomi and to Yahweh, God, and so he desires to marry her. And so Ruth runs home to tell Naomi, and Naomi, of course, is super pumped about this. She says, hey, go get him. Uh, Put your Sunday best on and go get him. And so Ruth and Boaz, they get married. They have a child. And the crazy thing about this child is it says, this baby would be the father of Obed, which isn't that big of a deal. But then when you read, who would later become the father of Jesse, who you're like, okay, maybe something's there, who later became the father of King David. It's pretty crazy. So the story of Ruth, from bitterness to restoration, the book of Ruth is this beautiful display of God's providential care over Naomi and Ruth and Boaz and even, eventually, Israel. Naomi lost everything, but little did she know that God was using Ruth's faithfulness to restore her life, her family, and her people. And so the takeaway from the book of Ruth is that we should trust in the providential care of the Lord in the moments of deep sorrow in our lives. And remember that God is faithful. Uh, Sorry, God is faithful, yes. Remember that God uses faithfulness to bring about redemption and salvation. Sermon number six is from Matthew chapter one, verse six, that says, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And the sermon title is, Don't Shoot Uriah Out. David's story is a mixed bag. David had some high highs and some low lows. He was a courageous shepherd boy. He went out and defeated Goliath, the champion of the Philistines. His fame spread throughout the land. He was promised The kingdom, he waited patiently as Saul the king tried to to murder him multiple times. David was a renaissance man. He could sling a rock and slay a mountain lion. He could lead troops into battle, yet he was musical. He could write poems and play the harp. 
basically the Hadley Welsh of 1000 BC. Shout out to Hadley. <laughs> Under David's leadership as king, Israel was in a golden era. Life was good. And David's throne became the model, the prototype that the prophets spoke of, that the Messiah would accomplish. He would bring peace back to Israel. But David, as good as he was, was definitely not the Messiah. David had his flaws. In 2 Samuel 11, David just so happened to be out on his balcony at a time when his attractive female neighbor just so happened to be bathing. A month later, he gets word that a baby was on the way after that whole incident. So he seeks to cover it, cover it up. He cooks up a few plans to try to make it seem like Uriah, her, her husband, is the father and they don't work. Eventually, he makes a plan to murder Uriah, but make it look accidental on the battlefield. These were not small sins. It was con conspiracy and murder and adultery. Some, some of these sins were the type of things that get you put away in jail for a very long time. And David grieves this. In Psalm 32, he says his bones were wasting away. And then he repents in Psalm 51. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Our God is a God of second chances, who, who welcomes repentant sinners. And David is ultimately called a man after God's own heart. But the overarching point from David's life is that even as good of a king as he was, he wasn't good enough. He's flawed. All the rulers of this world are still of this world. We're waiting for this king who has authority that is not of this world. And Matthew's whole gospel is shouting out that the new and better and perfect and without flaw son of David has come in Jesus the Christ. Sermon number seven is 999 wives too many. Solomon, David's son, was blessed with all the earthly treasures one can think of. He was ruler of Israel when the kingdom was strongest. He was rich in the way that Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates was rich before their divorce. He was also the valedictorian of the world, the human version of Siri, the wisest man to ever live. We see that in the story of scripture when Solomon first took over, he asked the Lord for wisdom so that he could shepherd the people of Israel, and that pleased the Lord, and the Lord gave him all the wisdom that one could want. And yet, that wisdom did not get him out of the snare of sin. We see that Israel was beginning to be a light to the nations as they were supposed to be, and Solomon wrote many proverbs that helped uh, Lord's people and even us today, where he wrote, do not lean on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart, above all else, to guard your heart and to rejoice in the wife of your youth. But instead of rejoicing in the wife of his youth, he rejoiced in 700 wives and 300 concubines. 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's an expensive Christmas. He thought he could work the system, too, by having all of these different wives, because what you do is he would build these houses for his foreign idol-worshiping wives to live in different houses, because they were not allowed to live in the house of the Lord. And what that is a picture of is us trying to keep sin separate in its own little department, in its own little life. But what sin wants is to master us, always. You can never keep sin in one little corner of your heart. Eventually, it will grow, and it brings forth death. Sin wants us to trust in our own wisdom and our own desires. It causes us to justify what we want, even if it contradicts the, wor the word. Solomon was very wise. He knew that he was to guard his heart above all else, but yet he did not stay the course. Sin eventually grew, and it tells us that his many wives turned away his heart from the Lord. See, Solomon points us to the fact that a good education, being really smart, is not what we need to fix our sin problem. We need hearts that long for the devotion, the pure devotion to the Lord. 
We need someone who is more wise and someone who has greater power than Solomon, and that person is Jesus Christ. Sermon number eight, Uh, we come to verse eight, where we read of this man named Joram. He's also known as Jehoram in the Old Testament, and O Jehoram, where to begin? Well, I know where to end. Second Chronicles tells us that this evil king of Judah has some major bowel problems toward the end of his life, hence the title, he was on the throne. A lot. There it is. I'm going to read Second Chronicles for you. Second Chronicles 21, 18. The Lord struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease. In the course of time, at the end of two years, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great agony. His people made no fire in his honor like the fires made for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem, and he departed with no one's regret. The Messiah came from this man's line. Chapter 1, verse 10, we read about another king, King Manasseh, who reigned for 55 years, which is why sermon number 9 is called 55 Reasons We Need Term Limits. Manasseh reigned in Judah for 55 long years and did everything that a king in Israel should not do. He set up idols in the temple for worship. He abandoned the scriptures, the law of Moses. He celebrated idolatry in his kingdom for over half a century. What's really horrific about Manasseh's reign is that he adopted a practice of child sacrifice from a neighboring pagan nation and even sacrificed some of his own children to pagan gods. In 2 Kings 21, it says, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. He had systemic government policy that encouraged the murder of children. But through the wicked family line of Manasseh, God was actually working out a plan for his own son to willingly shed his innocent blood as a payment For all the bloodshedders in the world like Manasseh, all the kings and all the violence of this world will be put to an end by the one who came to establish a kingdom of peace. And we will rejoice in the fact that of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. Sermon number 10 is titled, If You Don't Listen to the Lord, Then You Might Get Shot With an Arrow, Which Will Result in a Bad Wound and Eventual Death. So Manasseh had a son named Amos, who was very wicked also. And then he had a son named Josiah, who had to take over the throne when he was just eight years old because his dad, Amos, was murdered very soon after his taking over. And you would think that uh, Josiah, sorry, I'm confusing myself, let alone you guys out there, but you would think that Josiah would be evil like his dad and grandpa, but yet when he was 16, it says that he began to seek the Lord, that he sought the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might. And I've been praying that the Lord would just raise up a generation of Josiahs here within this church and within the surrounding community, that there would be teenagers that would seek the Lord with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their might. But the reason why Josiah was such a breath of fresh air is because of his response to the Word of God. See, Hilkiah, the high priest at the time, found the book of the law And it's been hidden for years because of the dad and grandpa. And when he read it to Josiah, Josiah tore his clothes. And that's a symbol of this, of the remorse that he had, that he wasn't following the Lord. And so what he did is he repented and then started to make massive reforms within Israel. That's why the scriptures say there is no king like him before or after And I want us to pick up on the simplicity here. He heard the word of God, repented, and changed what he could to be more in line with the word of God. He heard the word of God. What's that? I didn't hear you. He repented. repented. There we go. Yeah. 
That went over well. <laughs> we, in practice, it went really well. Yeah, it was awesome, man. He heard, he repented, he changed. And sometimes we make the Christian life so difficult. And we think, oh, I need to know more, or I, I don't know what God's will is for my life, or what am I, I'm not growing at all. And yet, we just need to start with these three steps. Listening to the Word of God, repenting when it convicts us, and then changing our lives so that it's more in line with the Word of God. At the end of his life, Josiah got involved in a war that he didn't need to be involved with, with the king of Egypt, and he was going to fight with the king of Egypt. And the king told him, the Lord has commanded me for you not to get involved in this. And he's like, no, it's all good. I'll just disguise myself and they won't know it's me. And so that's what he did. And what happened is he got shot with an arrow. And so there's another lesson for us here today. Always listen to the Lord or you might get shot with an arrow. Yeah. Sermon number 11, a captivating story. We learn about this man named Jeconiah. Jeconiah was one of the last kings of Judah that represented one of the darkest times, some would argue the darkest time in Israel's history, the Babylonian exile. And this time period was like, was kind of like when the billy goat ran onto the field during the 1945 World Series uh, match up against the Chicago Cubs and the Detroit Tigers. Uh, the curse of the billy goat lasted uh, 71 years, and throughout those 71 years, the Chicago Cubs were World Seriesless. So too with Israelite, the Israelites. According to God's judgment for their wickedness, King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he kidnaps and steals the Israelites to Babylon for 70 years. So you're left asking, what's going to happen to the Israelites? What's going to happen to God's promises of land and many offspring and blessing to bless all the families of the earth? Jeconiah and the exile was rock bottom for Israel. But in the midst of the darkness of exile, God kept a little lamp burning in Israel. He raises up a prophet named Ezekiel. And Ezekiel uh, was a prophet to Israel during the time of the Babylonian exile. And Ezekiel has this vision of a valley filled with dry bones. And the Lord says to Ezekiel, preach to these bones and say to them, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And so the bones begin to rattle and shake together and they form sinews, the muscles, the tendons, the skin forms, and the breath of the Lord goes into them. The valley of dry bones comes to life. What once was dead is now alive. Ezekiel's vision for the people of Israel was the hope of resurrection life in the midst of death. This was their hope that God would raise them to new life. It seemed that at the time Israel was way too far gone. Their sins, their past, their disobedience, deliberate sins, many years of, of violence and enslavement and death, but God delights to cause dead things to rise. And some of us might have those people in our minds here this morning that they seem too far gone. They seem outside of the radius of God's power to save them. And that is doubting God's very power. The gospel of God is that he is in the business of raising the dead. He delights in making dry bones become living, breathing vessels for his glory. Israel, many thought, was too far gone to be rescued. But God is mighty to save. Sermon number 12 is Zerubbabel in the house. Zerubbabel is a priest in Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Zerubbabel was overall a pretty decent guy, a good priest, a good pastor. I'd be happy to go to Zerubbabel's church. He led the people of Israel when they rebuilt the temple and the wall in Jerusalem. But there was a problem. The prophet Haggai, a short little book of Haggai, comes to Zerubbabel and he calls them out and he says this, is this a time for you to dwell in your paneled houses 
while the house of the Lord lies in ruins. Evidently, Zerubbabel and the people of Israel went back and they built their own houses and then they spent all their time shopping on Wayfair and going on Amazon and making their houses just as comfy and perfect as they wanted and they neglected the mission that God had sent them for. We've seen in this genealogy, there's a lot of bad sin, sins of commission, where people do bad things. But there's another category of sin, sin of omission, where we don't do the good things that we ought to do. That was Zerubbabel's problem. He got distracted with making his own life just how he wanted, and all the people of Israel did, and they neglected the mission of God. I think we all do that. We let a lot of good things creep in, and we miss out on the main things that God has called us to. This, of course, points to the great high priest who didn't just come to this world and not do bad things. He did the good things that honored his father. He touched lepers. He, he visited the poor. He laid down his life. Jesus said this, zeal for my father's house consumes me. He wasn't apathetic. He wasn't indifferent. He wasn't distracted by lesser pursuits. Jesus was and is the great high priest that we need. Sermon number 13 is relationship status, TBD. Uh, Mary and Joseph relationship definitely had some bumps in the road, even though the Lord gave them an unbelievable honor of giving birth to the Savior, Jesus Christ, he did not spare them from troubles. We read in Luke chapter 1 that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you will conceive a child, which is very good news. But then came after that vision, the awkward conversation with Joseph, where she says, I'm pregnant. And Joseph knows that it's not his and she's his fiance, and the Lord doesn't appear to Joseph right away, because in Matthew chapter 1, it says that he resolved to divorce Mary quietly, because he was a just man who didn't want to put her to public shame. And so the Lord allows Joseph to wrestle with this to the point where he's almost to divorce her. Then he intervenes and says, no, Joseph, stay with her. This is a son that was created by the Holy Spirit that will save people from their sins. And so Joseph stays with her, but yet the Lord doesn't spare Mary and Joseph from the public shame of Mary being pregnant before she was married. And we see from this situation that the Lord's ways are not our ways. The Creator chose to enter creation into a way that looked very scandalous, but was actually very pure. He chose a situation to enter into the world that would incite gossip and slander, especially in a small town, and not shield Mary and Joseph from that shame. What everyone thought was sin was actually the Lord doing something far greater than what any of us could even imagine. That a teenage virgin girl, a normal teenage girl, was about to give birth to the Son of God. And it's through this man, Jesus Christ, that we see the fulfillment of where we started in Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham. That through the line of Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That this is the coming Savior that was going to bring blessing to all the families of the earth. Often we can't perceive what the Lord is doing, or even when we think we know what the Lord is doing, His plans are usually so much bigger and different than what we can conceive of. But we can learn from this story and really from all the stories you've heard today that the Lord is faithful and that he will bring about his purposes. We now come to the 14th and final sermon in Matthew's genealogy called First Century Common Core Math. And it's clear that Jesus descended from a line of fairly dysfunctional people. And Matthew ends his uh, Jesus' Ancestry.com profile with a not-so-tight genealogy. So he he writes, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, 
and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now, upon further review, these numbers, they don't line up. There are several kings that are missing from this list. There are people that are highlighted and some that are left out. There were certainly more generations than uh, between these time periods. It was not a complete list by any means. So Matthew's genealogy is edited. It's an abridged version of the generations of Jesus. And it's done so in such a way that it holds up the number 14. And so the question is, why edit the genealogy and why make such a big deal about the number 14? Well, there's an ancient Jewish practice called gematria. And gematria is a system where you give number values to each letter in a word. So, for example, using the English alphabet, if your name was Bob, you would say 2152, which would equal 19. And so the name Bob would be represented by the number 19. So what we, what we find is that a person in the Old Testament scriptures with the number uh, that represents their name being 14, Dalit, Vav, Dalit. Those are the Hebrew letters D. V, D, David. What's also really cool is that the Hebrew alphabet doesn't have vowel letters, and so his name, if you read it in the Hebrew text, is literally DVD, David, 14, 464, adds up to 14. 14 is significant because 14 points directly to King David. 14 generations from Abe to Dave 14 generations from Dave to exile, 14 generations from the exile to the one who is called Christ. Christ means Messiah, anointed one, promised king. It's not Jesus' last name, it's his title. Jesus, the Lord, the master, the promised king from the line of David is here Matthew is making it crystal clear that this man born to Mary and Joseph is the Davidic king that was promised by God to be the one who would sit on the throne forever, bringing about restoration for God's people once and for all. So I hope you can see how this genealogy can preach to us. That Jesus comes from a long line of dysfunctional families, families that are made up of liars, cheaters, Prostitutes, murderers, adulterers, idolaters, pagans, manipulators, selfish, greedy, evil rulers. And yet this long line of dysfunctional families that Jesus came for or came from reflects the families that Jesus came for, as Andy said in the beginning. And I hope this also helps you understand the church, that the people of God, that we are a group of dysfunctional people, that God is still going to use to bring about his kingdom. That's very encouraging to me when I read through the scriptures and I see the type of people that the Lord uses. It's not perfect people. It's people who stumble and fall, people who are dysfunctional and messy, and yet the Lord continues to use them. And I hope that encourages you here this morning because our hope and desire is that in 2022, that all of us would grow more and more into our functional and perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your grace that we see through this lineage of Jesus and that you are sovereign over all of the sins in this world, over all of the evil, and that your purposes will not be thwarted, but that you will carry it out, and that your kingdom will come, and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. And so, Lord, we do ask that you would come, that you would continue to do that good work in each and all of us, that we would be conformed more and more into you, and that we would rightly reflect your glory, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hebrews chapter 2 says that Jesus became like his brothers so that he would be a merciful high priest. And we come now to the Lord's table, a time of communion, where we remember that Jesus' family and all that dysfunction was the type of people that he came for, and he's merciful as our high priest. This is a time for everyone who's committed to Jesus Christ, pledge your heart to him and said, he is Lord and Savior of my life, to come to the table and to remember his sacrifice on the cross. If you've never made that that pledge in your heart, we would ask that you refrain from partaking and think about where your heart is in relationship to God. I would also ask that after you receive the elements, you hold on to them, and I'll lead us to take them together as a sign that though we're individuals, we're one family in Christ. So as Addison plays, you can come forward, or there'll be trays in the back. You can receive the elements and spend time confessing your sin to the Lord and giving thanks for his mercy.